last speaker for this session is Professor Mark Kamilkowski from Johns Hopkins. And uh, now we'll switch topics and talk about gravitational waves and connections to dark matter. Okay, so I'm very pleased to be back on my native soil. I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. So I am a product of the great state of Ohio, uh, along with James Garfield, <coughs> Tad Dameron, an obscure uh, jazz composer most of you have probably never heard of. Anyway, I will tell you today about um, gravitational waves and compact dark matter. Um, what the story I will tell you about um, traces back to a paper that I wrote with a number of collaborators um, a few weeks after LIGO's spectacular announcement last year of the discovery of gravitational waves. Um, this proposal has made a number of people very angry, and it's been ruled out several times. Um, I will explain to you why I don't think it's necessarily ruled out, and although it is an idea that I would characterize as um, speculative, um, I think is interesting. And I have to say, one of the great things about this um, project and this line of research is that it's led to a number of um, very interesting offshoots um, by my collaborators and I and by plenty of other people. So the talk will involve gravitational waves, it'll involve dark matter, but it'll also involve other things in astrophysics, for example, fast radio bursts. So here are the collaborators. There's Simeon Bird, who's a, J a Johns Hopkins postdoc, who's now starting a faculty position at UC Riverside. Yasin Ali Hamoud, who's also a postdoc, who's now starting a faculty position at NYU. Um, Elias Cholis who's, and um, Eli Kovitz are still postdocs at uh, Johns Hopkins. If any of you are doing faculty searches this year, there are two very strong candidates right here. Um, Elias uh, Julian Munoz was a graduate student. He just uh, got his PhD in last weekend left for uh, Harvard University. Um, and then there's Alvise Racanelli who's moved on to a um, postdoctoral fellowship at Barcelona. Um, Adam Rees has a Nobel Prize, but it's for the discovery of cosmic expansion. And so it doesn't really qualify him to say anything um, <laughs> intelligent about primordial black holes or dark matter, at least no more so than any of the rest of us. Um, there was also follow-up work that um, I did with Liang Dai, who's a former student, is now a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, Tomohiro Nakama, who's a new postdoc at Johns Hopkins, and Patrick Bricey, who uh, just, no, he's leaving uh, this weekend. He's leaving um, Baltimore to start a new postdoc position at CETA, and Joe Silk, who you may have heard of. So um, this is the gravitational wave event, and it was spectacular. It was great because we didn't need a Bayesian analysis. We didn't need the theoretical curve, curve to guide the eye. There are oscillations in Hanford. There are oscillations in Livingston. It's a gravitational wave. Um, by fitting the parameters, by fitting the curves, the waveforms, they were able to learn a number of things about the system of the, produced the gravitational waves. And the system com consisted of two black holes, one of which had a mass of 36 plus or minus something, and the second which had a mass of 29 plus or minus something. So both of them roughly 30 solar mass, the merger of two solar mass black holes. When this was first announced, it was surprising to a number of us, although I'll have some more to say about that a little bit later in the talk. And the reason is that we believe that black holes are stellar remnants. And black holes come from the, um, arises the endpoints of massive stars above, you know, eight solar masses or so. And massive stars, because the initial mass function is very steeply falling with mass, are very, very rare. And so, and we know that, you know, the, we believe that the minimum mass for a, a black hole remnant is maybe three to five solar masses. And so I think a number of us were surprised that the two initial masses, or the masses for the initial event they discovered were 30, 30 solar masses. And so we decided to think a little bit about why you would have such massive black holes forming. And since I and many of my colleagues are cosmologists, we think a lot about dark matter. <coughs> and we don't know what the dark matter is, so when we learn about anything new, we wonder if it might be the dark matter. So this was the question we asked. Can 30 solar mass primordial black holes be the dark matter? And so the eight of us collaborated on a brief Google search and wrote, um, uncovered this paper by Quinn et al. from 2009. And this paper showed constraints to compact dark matter, massive compact dark matter. Um, and there is an old constraint from the 90s that traces back to microlensing due uh, largely to the work of Andy Gould, who was at 
Ohio State for a number of years, or has been at Ohio State for a number of years. And then there were a number of constraints um, published from wide binaries, and there was some controversy about what they were, but it seemed to us that the 30 solar mass compact dark matter window was surprisingly open. And so that allows us the possibility to write a paper saying that maybe these are 30 solar mass black holes. That is a pretty low quality paper, but there was something more interesting that we discovered that made we think the paper worth writing. So it turns out that if you have two black holes running through a galactic halo, so suppose 30 solar mass black holes make up the dark matter, you'll have two of them occasionally running past each other. And when they pass each other, they can Rutherford scatter because they have a one over R squared, they interact via one over R squared force law. And when they Rutherford scatter, there's a time varying quadrupole moment for the system. And if there's a time varying quadrupole moment, that time varying quadrupole moment gives rise to gravitational radiation. So there is a gravitational Bremsstrahlung process that arises when you take two massive objects and have them pass by each other. And it is very straightforward to calculate this. Um, winds up giving you interesting numerical prefactors like 85 pi over the six square root of two to the two sevenths. That does not come from the back of the envelope estimate, but it actually comes if you use the front of the envelope as well. <laughs> and the cross section turns out to be small. It's some number. Um, it is roughly speaking um, the Schwarzschild radius divided by the velocity in units of the speed of light to the 18th sevenths power. But you can calculate it, and then you can ask, so what happens is if you have two of these black holes, they go by, they pass by each other, and they emit gravitational radiation. If they are moving very slowly initially, they can emit enough gravitational radiation that they will become bound, that the energy carried away will be enough to make the energy of the remaining system negative. And so this is actually a gra this is actually the cross section, not for, um, for um, gravitational Bremsstrahlung, more specifically, this is the cross section for the gravitational analog of a free bound transition. So I have two black holes that are unbound. They can emit some gravitational waves and then wind up with a bound binary black hole system. So this is the cross section for the production of a bound binary. Cr binary. The binaries that are formed are actually very, very um, tight. The black holes are just a few, you know, a uh, few orders of magnitude greater um, separated by distance a few orders of magnitude greater than the Schwarzschild radius. And so they very rapidly in spiral and merge to f and produce a gravitational wave burst like that shown, um, seen by LIGO. So we then calculate a rate. So we did a back of the envelope estimate first of the rate at which you expect these black holes to merge um, throughout the universe. So the rate at which you expect any, you know, a, black holes to merge in, say, a galactic halo like the Milky Way's galactic halo is one-half times the volume of the halo times the density in units of the, um, divided by the black hole mass squared. So this is the number density of such things times sigma v. So this is n sigma v, the rate per unit volume, times the volume, and then there's the one-half because you needed the one-half. And it turns out to be this number, and then we know what the abundance of Milky Way type halos is throughout the universe, so we multiply by that number there. And what we find is that the rate of such black hole mergers, if they make up the dark matter, if 30 solar mass black holes make up the dark matter, the rate at which they merge through this gravitational free bound process is about 10 to the minus fourth per gigaparsec cube per year. Now, it turns out though that galactic halos are complicated. The density in galactic halos is not the mean density. The dark matter density has a broad distribution. And the reason is that any individual galactic halo is formed through mergers of smaller galactic halos. And this goes back to very early times. So if you look at any particular region of the, of the, of the galactic halo in the Milky Way, you will find that there are clumps of dark matter. And the velocity and density dependence of this cross-section are such that the merger rate will be dominated by the lowest mass subclumps within any given halo. So if you assume that all the dark matter is distributed in the subclumps in Milky Way halos, in um, halos, so this is a picture of what a Milky Way halo might look like, lots of substructure, the rate that you get is 10 to the three per gigaparsec cube per year, as opposed to the lower estimate, which is 10 to the minus four. So there are seven orders of magnitude in which the merger rate could actually reside. And so we decided to do a slightly more detailed calculation. 
Um, and so we did a state-of-the-art calculation. We used the best available information about the subclump distribution within halos, about the press sector, the, the mass functions of galactic halos, and the velocity um, mass distributions. And some of the people on the author list are actually eminently qualified to do this. And we plugged in the numbers, and what we found is that using state-of-the-art estimates for the distribution of dark matter in galactic halos, the rate at which black holes would merge to form LIGO-like events if 30 solar mass black holes make up the dark matter is five per gigaparsec cube per year, and there's some other factors over here. And then we look at the LIGO paper. This is from the abstract of the LIGO paper. It says, from that one event that they observed, the original event, the estimate of the merger rate of such 30 by 30 solar mass black holes is two to 53 gigaparsecs per year. So there's this amazing coincidence between the rate at which 30 solar mass black holes would merge if they made up the dark matter and the merger rate that you infer from this initial LIGO event. So I started a primordial black hole dark matter report card. So the first test, the merger rate, A, this is an amazing coincidence. So this is maybe an idea that's worth exploring. If we simply postulate that 30 solar mass black holes are the dark matter, they cannot be immediately ruled out in any simple and obvious and robust way, and they just happen to merge at a rate that coincides with that inferred from the LIGO. But there might be astrophysical constraints, and since this work appeared, a number of authors have written papers discussing various astrophysical consequences of 30 solar mass primordial black holes, and some of them um, claiming that the scenario is ruled out. So there's a very nice paper by Tim Brandt that appeared very shortly afterwards, where he showed that, th or argued that 30 solar mass dark matter would disrupt star clusters, um, cold star clusters at the center of cer certain dwarf galaxies. So dwarf galaxies are regions with very high dark matter concentrations, and within dwarf galaxies, you sometimes see a stellar cluster, and there's one, for example, called Eridanus II, that has a very cold stellar cluster at the center. And since primordial black holes, 30 solar mass objects, are more massive than the solar mass objects that um, are responsible for most of the light in such a star cluster, um, the 30 solar mass dark matter would heat the star cluster, and it wouldn't be as cold as you see. So Tim worked out the consequences, and he was able to rule out, or claimed, that such arguments rule out um, 30 solar mass dark matter. So this is the fraction of the halo mass as a function of mass. Here are the microlensing constraints, the wide binary constraints, and he claimed that you can rule this out, this scenario out with dwarf galaxies. And it's a great paper. It's uh, very elegantly written. Um, but there are some caveats that you can make. Um, there are central, um, there are intermediate mass black holes that are believed to arise in certain star clusters, and if such an intermediate blast black hole were to exist in the Eridanus cluster, the constraint would be um, obliterated. Um, the cluster is assumed to be at the center of the dark matter halo, but when you look at simulations, star clusters are sometimes formed off center. Um, the satellites are assumed to have had the same mass for, the, for 10 billion years. Um, I think I said this, this is, I said this twice. Um, there's some evidence for tidal stripping um, with the Milky Way. If so, then maybe the outskirts of the stellar cluster have been stripped out, and that's why it seems to be cold. And the other thing is that the analysis assumes a monochromatic stellar mass function, that all the stars have the same masses. And if you relax that, you relax the bounds slightly. So this is a great argument. I think it should be pursued and studied further, but I don't know that it actually robustly rules out 30 solar mass primordial black hole dark matter. So I think the primordial black hole dark matter still passes this test. Um, there were also constraints claimed in a paper um, from a decade ago by Riccati, Ostreicher, and Mack. So if primordial black holes make up the dark matter, then they would have been around in the primordial plasma before the cosmic microwave background last scattered. And if you have a black hole immersed in a plasma, the black hole is going to accrete from the plasma. And when gas gets accreted onto a black hole, the gas gets compressed, very highly compressed and heated near the black hole, and then it, that heating gives rise to um, X-ray and other electromagnetic radiation that then goes out and heats up the, um, the, interstellar, the, the intergalactic medium. So what happens is 
heating via accretion of primordial plasma onto the black hole changes the um, recombination history, the rate at which electrons and protons combine to form hydrogen, and therefore changes the angular power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. And it also can give rise to spectral distortions in the frequency spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. And this paper claimed that these constraints rule out primordial black hole, um, constrain primordial black holes to have a density no, no greater than 10 to the minus four of the dark matter density of the universe today. So there's a very strong constraint from this paper. But more recently, Yassin Ali Hamoud and I, and also Horowitz and um, Alon Bloom and Flauger, Flauger have um, redone the analysis, and um, we don't think that there's a constraint. So when we redo the, uh, the, the, the entire analysis, using, by the way, updated data from Planck rather than the WMAP data that was used 10 years ago, we find that there's no constraint. And more precisely, here's the constraint. Um, above 100 solar masses seems to, be, uh, seems to heat up the, the primordial plasma too much but 30 solar masses still seems to be okay. And I should say there were three independent such analyses that all made slightly different assumptions about the, the, the different you know, in, input physics, but we all reached more or less the same conclusion. So I think the cosmic microwave background constraints do not rule out the scenario. I don't think there are cosmic microwave background constraints. Um, there have been a, there's a very interesting paper by Media Via recently that claimed that the smooth lens model for strong lensing systems constrains 30 solar mass dark matter. So you have certain strong lensing systems. You see multiple images from, of, of an individual quasar. Those multiple images path through different lines of sight through the, the galaxy, um, through the lens. The lens, if it's composed of 30 solar mass black holes, some of those lines of sight will occasionally be microlensed, and you will get an alteration to the standard smooth lens model. Um, so this paper appeared very recently. I've not yet time, had time to fully digest it in the other papers to which it refers to, um, but I'm not yet convinced that this is a robust result. Um, so I don't give it a passing or not passing grade. I think uh, I'm going to give it an incomplete. Um, this, I believe, is a very, very um, interesting problem and potentially the strongest constraint to the scenario. So um, Sasaki and collaborators pointed out that if you have 30 solar mass, if you have primordial black holes, um, those primordial black holes will produce binaries very early on in the universe, shortly after the cosmic microwave background decouples. And the basic idea is the merger tree. So if we look at a galactic halo, it's a massive object today, but as we go back in time, it was formed from the merger of smaller objects. And as we go earlier and earlier times, the, 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 the constituents become smaller and smaller. But there's some initial step at which you take two dark matter objects and form the first so-called halo, the first halo, which is a binary. And so Sasaki pointed out that the initial stage in this merger hierarchy is the formation of primordial binaries. And, if his, calcula and his calculation implies that there will be far more primordial binaries if 30 solar mass objects make up the dark matter, there will be far more primordial binaries than LIGO can, has seen. LIGO would have seen 10,000 such events already rather than a handful. So this is a very interesting argument, but um, the survival of these primordial binaries is uncertain. As we go through these subsequent stages of mergers, these binaries get stressed via dynamical interactions with other halos, with other systems, with baryons, et cetera. And um, Yassin, Ali Hamoud, and Eli Kovitz and I have been looking at this. There's also a paper by Ahaya Saki et al. Um, and we're not really sure, honestly, whether these binaries survive or not. There are arguments that say they do, but also arguments they don't. We're still trying to figure it out. So I give this also an incomplete. Um, there were other astrophysical constraints. Um, there was a paper by Gagero et al. and Inoue and Kuzenko that claimed that accretion um, of the interstellar medium onto such black holes in our own Milky Way would give rise to X-ray and radio um, emission that would have been seen already. Um, I'm not so sure about that because the calculation of accretion rates onto a black hole in the interest, from the interstellar medium are highly uncertain. And I think that um, within the uncertainties, the scenario can still survive. So I don't think that that is a robust constraint. An interesting argument, though. Um, so the final question, though, is if such objects can exist, where would they come from? And honestly, I have no good idea for this. We had no explanation for the origin of these 30 solar mass primordial black holes. We simply 
postulated that even if we can't figure out where they come from, the Big Bang somehow figured out. The Big Bang somehow figured out how to produce neutrinos and photons and baryons. Maybe the Big Bang also figured out how to produce primordial black hole dark matter. And since our paper has appeared, there have been no shortage of papers explaining where such primordial black holes can come from. Um, supergravity inflation, contracting universes, critical Higgs inflation, etc. cetera. Um, these scenarios, I would say, are all highly contrived. I don't think any of them is at all natural. So I think that the primordial black holes don't fail this test, but uh, I think it's a D. But on the other hand, when we think about dark matter in the year 2017, it's not quite it was, what it was 30 years ago. So dark matter model building in 1987 was we postulate a WIMP, it's got an annihilation cross-section which sets its relic abundance, and then that gives us a direct detection cross-section. This is dark matter model building in 2017. Not quite so simple anymore. We've got asymmetric dark matter. We've got self-interacting dark matter. We've got stereo neutrinos, light force carriers, ultralight dark matter, et cetera, et cetera. So put another way, this is dark matter built, model building in 1987. Simple, elegant lines of minimalist architecture. And this is dark matter model building in 2017. <laughs> so if we grade on a curve, I think that uh, <laughs> we're doing fine. So in the few remaining minutes, I want to tell you about ways, in addition to those I discussed already, that we might test the scenario in the future. And it's interesting. There are a number of interesting ways we can um, pursue this. So first of all, there are going to be far more gravitational wave events. Um, given the initial merger rates that we've seen and the sensitivities of LIGO, Virgo, and the worldwide network of gravitational wave detectors, it's conceivable that we will see tens, you know, 10,000, maybe even 20,000 binary black hole mergers within the next decade. So we're going to be doing population statistics 10 years from now, just like we do with gamma ray bursts today. So one prediction is that these primordial binaries will be eccentric, very highly eccentric. This is the eccentricity distribution that we calculate. It's peaked at very, very eccentric. If you have an eccentric binary merger, then in addition to the fundamental frequency, which is what you see if you have circular orbits, you also see higher frequency or you know, higher um, modes um, in your gravitational waveform. And this is something that can actually be sought with LIGO or Virgo or in the future with the Einstein telescope and we predict that a future generation experiment like the Einstein telescope might see 10 such events if primordial black holes make up the dark matter. There's also the binary mass distribution. So certainly LIGO's going to see lots of black hole mergers from stellar remnants. And we expect the stellar remnant mass function to be relatively smooth and perhaps falling like a power law like this. And if you assume a power law, steeply falling power law mass function, then the rate at which you expect to see binary black hole merges as a function of the constituent masses actually peaks for LIGO around 30. So in retrospect, the fact that the initial events they saw were two 30 solar mass black holes, in retrospect, is perfectly consistent with a stellar mass, um, stellar rem mass remnant hypothesis, interestingly enough. But if in addition to these stellar mass remnants, there are primordial black holes that have 30 solar masses, you'll see a bump in this mass distribution. Um, you have not only the mass distribution, but you have the two-dimensional distribution function for the two masses. You've got a mass M1 and mass M2. And what we showed is that by using this two-dimensional mass distribution, you actually get more information than you can infer simply from, from this plot. And so Eli Kovitz has followed up, and this is the upper limit to the mass function of compact or primordial black hole dark matter um, that you might get with six more years of LIGO data. Um, if you see no such further events. Um, this, I think, is my favorite so far. Um, so tomorrow morning, you're going to hear a talk by Vicky Caligera on fast radio bursts. So fast radio bursts are very interesting objects. They're millisecond flashes of radio frequency radiation coming from the sky. 
Um, there are roughly 10,000 of them on the sky per day, but we've only seen about 20 so far because we look at very small regions of the sky with current telescopes. Um, they have large dispersion measures, which imply that they are most likely from cosmological coming from cosmological distances. And the interesting thing, or one of the interesting things is that forthcoming experiments, like the one that Vicky will talk about tomorrow morning, um, should see within a few years thousands of such fast radio bursts. So let me skip ahead. So if you see a fast radio burst, and if there is a 30 solar mass dark matter object along the line of sight, that object can lens the source. So instead of seeing one image, you'll see two images. These two images are separated by an angular scale that's extremely small. But there will be a time difference, and that time difference turns out to be a few milliseconds. So if 30 solar mass compact objects make up the dark matter, you will expect to see several such events in which there is an echo in which the initial fast radio burst is followed by a second one a few milliseconds later. And if you see no such events after several years with time, you'll be able to rule out um, compact object dark matter from about 10 solar masses and upward all the way down to a fraction of roughly a, a percent of the dark matter of the known to exist. Um, there will also be, people have also discussed clustering of gravitational waves with galaxies to test the scenario. Um, people have discussed the stochastic gravitational wave background that the scenario predicts. Um, Nakamura et al. described how you could use the redshift distribution of um, black hole merger events to test the scenario with future experiments like DESIGO and ELISA. Um, there is a pulsar timing constraint that was discussed. This is the plot from the paper by Schutz and Liu. These are not current constraints. These are the constraints that they forecast you might be able to obtain by analyzing current pulsars and future pulsars. Um, Sasha Kashlinsky pointed out that there can be consequences for the cosmic infrared background because you produce many more small objects, early objects, um, in this scenario. And there was a very, two very interesting um, papers recently, one by my former student, Liang Dai, and his collaborators, another by um, Nick Kaiser, um, Diego et al., which uh, Nick, included Nick Kaiser and collaborators. Um, both papers are great. Um, the one by my former student is just a little bit better. Um, what they pointed out is that um, there are certain strong lensing systems um, for which there are caustics that we know quite a bit about. And so in these caustics, the lensing magnification can be huge. So big, in fact, that the granularity of the dark matter starts to have an impact. And so they discussed the impact of this granularity on lensing, and they showed that, um, that you could actually learn a lot about the, you know, the, the, the distribution of mass at the smallest um, distances in dark matter. Um, and then Will Dawson gave a really nice talk at a W First seminar a few months ago where he pointed out that W First could ex extend the current macho constraints um, to, much further ma to, to much larger masses. Um, and then people have also talked about an extended mass function. We simply postulated for simplicity that all the dark matter has the same mass, but perhaps there's some type of press sector, um, some type of sector mass function. Um, so the observational outlook is great for gravitational waves. There's going to be a number of new um, instruments coming online within the next few decades, in addition to LIGO and Virgo. There are prospects for LISA, DESIGO, et cetera. And in terms of um, fast radio bursts, there's CHIME. There's another 21-centimeter um, observatory called HIRAX that may be able to make some such measurements. Um, here's the timeline for LIGO, Einstein telescope, DESIGO, um, the fast radio burst telescopes. And I will simply conclude. So um, dark matter is one of the most longstanding and important questions in fundamental physics, or in science in general, I think. And um, there are no simple and obvious solutions. So you know, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, we thought it was going to be WIMPs. It's such a great coincidence. But uh, that scenario has not yet yielded results. Um, 30 solar mass primordial black holes are, I meant to say, speculative. It's a nutty idea, but it's not crazy. Um, there are some tensions with um, current astrophysical observations that have been reported, but I don't think that there are any silver bullets that rule out this scenario robustly. 
And it's a great thing to have been working on the past year because uh, my collaborators and I, in particular, have learned a lot about gravitational wave astrophysics, their implications for the early universe. Um, there are lots of things that you can do with lensing and microlensing. Um, there are some consequences for high energy astrophysics, um, galactic dynamics, fast radio bursts. So it's a great thing, I think, to be thinking about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we have time for one question. There's a question down here. Thank you for your great, great talk. Um, so you briefly mentioned about the different possible scenarios at early universe for the origin of primordial black holes. Uh, but uh, do you think primordial black holes could, uh, uh, could be formed not at the Big Bang moment, but during nonlinear regime through non-canonical interaction of dark matter? Nonlinear regime when? Uh, do you, uh, through non-canonical uh, non, non interaction of dark matters after nonlinear regime, like at nonlinear regime. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was having lunch with Nima Arkani Hamad last Thursday, and we were thinking about it. Um, so the answer is I don't know. It's an interesting question, but I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> And on that note, let's thank uh, Mark again and all of our speakers.